have created an unseen umbilical bond to the world i'm abhishek maharajan coming up in the next 30 minutes suspected israeli war planes bomb iran's embassy in damascus syria white house says president joe biden is aware of reports of israeli air strikes Senior US and Israel officials hold a virtual meeting over Rafa. Israelis agree to consider US concerns about Rafa offensive. Follow-up talks to be held next week. North Korea fires ballistic missile into the Sea of Japan. South Korean military says launch appears to be an intermediate range missile. Election campaign heats up for India's upcoming parliamentary elections. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to address rallies in Indian states of Uttarakhand and Rajasthan. All right, news in detail now. Suspected Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's embassy in Syria on Monday in an escalation of Israel's war against Iran's regional proxies. Iran said the attack killed seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders. Iran's ambassador to Syria said the strike hit a consular building in the embassy compound and that his residence was on the top two floors. While well, Iranian media reported that a building close to the embassy had been hit, However, an Israeli military spokesperson said, and I quote, we do not comment on reports in the foreign media, unquote. White House spokesperson Karine Joppe said that the US President Joe Biden is aware of reports of Israel strikes in Damascus. Listen in. So, look, I'm aware of the reports. Our team is looking into it, so I'm not going to get ahead of, of anything just yet. But obviously, we're aware of the reports and our team is looking into it. I'm just not going to go beyond that. The United States and Israel on Monday held what the White House calls a high-priority virtual meeting to discuss the alternatives to a military invasion of the Gazan city of Rafah. Israeli forces have for weeks been planning to push into the southern tip of the BC Strip, where more than a million displayed Palestinians are gathered, but the US is suggesting a delay. Did India's Benji Hire reports. This was a, a hastily rearranged meeting, initially cancelled by the Israelis after the US abstained from a United Nations Security Council resolution which called for a ceasefire in Gaza. The Biden administration said an operation in Rafah would exacerbate the humanitarian disaster in the war-torn Palestinian territory, where famine, the UN warns, is imminent. The president's urging Israel to pause its plans to first stabilize the humanitarian situation and secure Egypt's side of the border with Gaza. Israel insists its offensive must continue south in order to eliminate the threat posed by the terror group Hamas. That's a position that puts the Israeli government on a collision course with its greatest Western ally here. Despite its fears over a Rafah incursion and the growing death toll in Gaza, the White House last week authorised the transfer of billions of dollars in bombs and fighter jets to Israel. A second meeting with the US, this time in person, is scheduled to take place as soon as next week. Benji Haya in Washington, reporting for DD India. And further, a joint statement was issued after the virtual meet, according to which the Israeli officials agreed on Monday to take US concerns about a planned offensive in Rafah into account and deliberating on alternative ways to root out Hamas from southern Gaza. U.S. officials concerned about a deepening humanitarian crisis in Gaza have urged Israel to take a more targeted approach to attacking Hamas without launching a major ground offensive. The joint statement said the two sides had a constructive engagement on Rafah and agreed they shared the objective of seeing Hamas defeated there. Now, France on Monday proposed a draft United Nations Security Council resolution that seeks options for possible UN monitoring of a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip 
and proposals to help the Palestinian Authority assume responsibilities. The text would need at least nine votes in favor and no vetoes by four other permanent members, the United States, Britain, Russia and China. The draft resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza and demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages still held in Gaza by Hamas and others. This draft resolution deals with the most pressing matters. It calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza without a time limitation. It also demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. It condemns the terrorist attacks by Hamas that took place on October 7, and it demands an immediate and full humanitarian access. We are just starting. It's an ambitious project. It will take time. We need to consult everyone. An Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu revived moves on Monday to shutter Qatari satellite television station Al Jazeera in Israel while the conflict in Gaza continues. The Neset approved the bill allowing the temporary closure in Israel of foreign broadcasters considered to be a threat to national security. The law approved on Monday allows Netanyahu and the security cabinet to shut the station for a period of 45 days. The ban is renewable and would stay in force until the end of July or until the end of major military operations in Gaza. Neither the station's main office in Israel nor the Qatari government in Doha have reacted so far. A Moscow's court has put the 10th suspect in the March 22nd deadly concert hall attack into custody until May 22nd pending trial. The court said the use of Zoda Yakub Joni Davlat Khan a native of Tajikistan had been charged under Russia's terrorist act. Earlier on Sunday, Russia's state security service said foreign fighters detained in Russia's southern region of Dagestan were involved in financing of the attack. The FSB also said that one of the four detained men had confessed to personally bringing weapons to the Moscow attackers. At least 144 people were killed in the March 22nd attack. Islamic State has claimed responsibility, but Russia is investigating the other angles too. The French government has raised its terror alert warning to its highest level following the shootings on Moscow Concert Hall. The decision was taken in light of the Islamic State's claiming responsibility for the Moscow attack and the threats weighing in our country. The alert allows for exceptional security measures such as stepped up patrols by armed forces in public places like train stations, airport and religious sites. The development comes months before Paris hosts the Olympic Games. Now, several U.S. states are holding presidential primaries Tuesday with President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump expected to win across the board. Voters will head to the polls in the states of Wisconsin, Connecticut, New York and Rhode Island. But some residents are planning on using the vote as an opportunity to protest against the leading candidates. Did India Sally Patterson reports from New York. U.S. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are the favorites in their respective primaries. Neither candidate faces a strong challenge, and they've both already secured more delegates than they need to win their party's nominations. That process will happen at their conventions in July and August. That's when the Biden-Trump rematch becomes official. But that doesn't mean it's all smooth sailing. Voters can decide to register a protest vote against Biden or Trump if they're not happy with the options. In Connecticut and Rhode Island, residents will have the option of voting uncommitted. In Wisconsin, voters can choose uninstructed delegation on their ballot. Wisconsin is a pivotal battleground state in the U.S., and some voters there are organizing over the war in Gaza. A group of activists are aiming to show they're unhappy with Biden's ongoing support for Israel by refusing to vote for him on the ballot. But analysts warn caution in putting too much significance on Gaza when it comes to the U.S. electorate. According to Gallup Research, according to Gallup Research Group, the number of voters who list it as the nation's most important problem is under 1%. The leading key issue for voters include the economy, immigration and crime. 
Sally Patterson in New York, reporting for DD India. For Paris on Monday as part of a five-day trip to France and Belgium. According to a State Department statement, Blinken will meet with French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris to discuss global issues including support for Ukraine, preventing the spread of conflict in Gaza and stabilizing Haiti. In Brussels, the Secretary of State will attend the NATO Foreign Minister's meeting, which coincides with NATO's 75th anniversary on 4th April. The Secretary will also visit the Belgian city of Leuven, where he will participate in the 6th US-EU Trade and Technology Council. Five people were killed in southern Poland due to strong winds on Monday. Trees fell as wind reached a speed of 155 km an hour. Firefighters intervened 140 times to remove trees blocking roads and help owners of houses with destroyed roofs. In a case of extreme weather, the winds followed days of unusually high temperatures in the region. And in the Haitian capital, Port au Prince, five people were found dead on Monday after reports of heavy gunfire in the streets approaching the National Palace. Gunmen seized an armoured vehicle from palace guards in the centre of the city. A large industrial park had been set on fire three days before. The new US ambassador to Haiti, Dennis Hankins, arrived in the country on Monday as the United States and other nations continue evacuating their citizens and bolstering their borders against the migrants. Haiti has been facing a worsening conflict with alliances of gangs vying for control of parts of the capital and attacks on the airport and main port blocking access to key goods. Now Mexico evacuated 34 nationals who wanted to leave Haiti as gang violence spread in the country. The helicopter moved the evacuees which included seven miners to a ship from the Navy that brought the nationals back to Mexico. The Mexican government said in a statement the special operation was deployed because Haiti's Tosin Lovator International Airport has been legally controlled by armed groups. Foreign departures from Haiti have picked up recently as the country's political future hangs in limbo with armed gangs expanding their control over the capital and further afield. U.S. authorities working on the Baltimore Bridge collapse have opened the first of the two small temporary channels to let ships access the site of the incident. The channels will initially only be open to vessels involved in the Francis Scott Key Bridge cleanup operation and will not be big enough to allow cargo and container ships to pass through. This effort marks the first step in reopening the port of Baltimore following the collapse of the bridge early that killed six road workers. The Biden administration released $60 million in initial emergency aid on Thursday to assist in cleaning up the bridge debris and reopening the port. Now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. A vehicle crashed into the front gate of America's Federal Bureau of Investigation's Atlanta office on Monday. The driver was taken into custody and an investigation is underway. Three flights carrying 368 deported migrants arrived in Guatemala City from the U.S. on Monday. The migrants were picked up at the U.S.-Mexico border trying to reach the United States. According to official data from Guatemala, the U.S. has sent more than 19,000 immigrants back in 2024. In a festive crossover, a giant Easter bunny took the mic and greeted journalists during the White House press briefing on Monday. As part of an April Fool's joke, White House Press Secretary Karine jean pierre stood alongside the bunny, saying the White House would revoke the Hatch Act, which prohibits federal employees from using their official capacity to interfere with the elections. Thank you. One of the largest jackpots in the history of the U.S., the multi-state Powerball, is now for grabs. This year's estimated jackpot prize at $975 million, the fifth largest in the history of the game. If there is a single winner on Monday, the ticket holder can choose to accept it in a single lump sum, with the prize carrying a cash value of about $471.7 million. 
Alright, we'll slip into a very short break, but still to come on this edition of DD India Live. South Korea's UN urges doctors to end impasse, says government is open to talks with the doctors. Campaigning for India's parliamentary elections heats up. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi will address public meetings in Uttarakhand and Rajasthan today. And 19 traditional products of Assam, two of Tripura get the GI tag. India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD in the live. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. Some more stories. North Korea fired a ballistic missile off the East Coast in a move that sparked immediate condemnation from the Prime Minister of Japan. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said that it detected the launch of what appeared to be a ballistic missile of an intermediate range class from the area of the North Korean capital Pyongyang. Japan's Coast Guard said the apparent missile had already fallen into the sea. Amid concerns Russia and North Korea are developing closer military links, the United States and its major Asian allies, South Korea and Japan, are expanding security cooperation. The United States government is arranging a summit between President Joe Biden and his Japanese and South Korean counterparts in July on the sidelines of a NATO summit in Washington. This is the third test of ballistic missiles from King Jong Un's regime this year. On March 18th, North Korea fired at least six short range ballistic missiles as a leader oversaw a test of multiple rocket launcher systems. And South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said the government is open to talks with doctors who oppose his plan to increase medical school admissions. Yoon signaled his willingness for the first time to seek a compromise on his medical reform proposals. Listen in. If doctors come up with a more proper and reasonable solution, we can discuss it as much as they want. Government policy is always open. If they present better opinions and rational grounds, government policy can change for the better. More than 90% of the country's 13,000 training doctors have been staging walkouts since February 20th in protest against the government's plan to boost medical school admissions by 2000 starting in 2025 from 3000 now. The government says the plan is vital to remedy a shortage of doctors in one of the world's fastest aging societies, but critics have said the authorities should focus on improving the working conditions of trainee doctors first. Now, a Pakistani court on Monday granted former Prime Minister Imran Khan an appeal of his graft conviction and suspended his 14-year jail sentence. Just a week before the February 8 elections, Imran Khan and his wife were handed a 14-year sentence on charges of unlawfully selling state gifts. Despite the suspension, Khan will remain in jail on multiple other sentences which were imposed on him ahead of the polls, which also disqualified him from holding any public office for 10 years. Now let's get you the latest on world's largest democratic elections in India. Campaigning for India's parliamentary elections heats up. Leaders of all political parties have begun their campaign. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi will address public meetings in Uttarakhand and Rajasthan today. PM Modi will speak at public gatherings in Uttarakhand's Rudrapur and Kotputli in Rajasthan. 
रुद्रापुर एंड उत्तराखंड इज पार्ट ऑफ द नैनीताल उधम सिंह नगर कॉन्स्टिट्युएंसी इंडिया होम मिनिस्टर एंड बीजेपी सीनियर लीडर अमित शाह विल विजिट सदर्न स्टेट ऑफ कर्नाटका टुडे ड्यूरिंग हिज विजिट ही विल एड्रेस शक्ति केंद्र पार्टी वर्कर्स इन बेंगलुरु एंड होल्ड अ रोड शो इन चन्ना पाटना व्हिच इज पार्ट ऑफ बेंगलोर रूरल लोकसभा कॉन्स्टिट्युएंसी and the congress on monday released the list of candidates for maharashtra and telangana for upcoming parliamentary elections congress has fielded abhay kashinath patel from akolar maharashtra and kadiyam kavya is set to contest from warangal telangana and as the clock ticks down to the general elections of 2024 Did India takes a jog down history to look at the historic elections that have shaped the polity and political landscape of our nation since independence. The seven phase election spread over 44 days and 4 months is the second longest election in the history of Indian democracy. How has Indian elections evolved over the years from the use of physical ballots to electronic voting machines? Take a look. After independence till 1952 India was run by an interim legislature known as the Indian Constituent Assembly the election commission is an independent constitutional authority brought into force from November 26 1949 whereas most of its other provisions were made effective from January 26 1950 when the constitution of India became effective the first ever elections were held on the basis of universal adult franchise which is associated with article 326 of the indian constitution it states that all citizens regardless of their caste education religion gender color race and economic conditions are free to vote and anyone over the age of 21 years old could cast their franchise the voting age in india was reduced to 18 years by the 61st constitutional amendment in 1989 India has an interesting story from how its elections transitioned from voting via ballot paper to electronic voting machines and then to VVPATs that is voter verifiable paper audit trail. During the 1952 elections a low level of literacy was a major challenge. There were over 173 million voters most of them had no experience of voting. So in the first elections in India the symbols of respective candidates were affixed on ballot boxes to facilitate voters no mark was made on the ballot paper to cast a vote the ballot paper was simply put by the voter in a box carrying the symbol of the candidate of their choice this helped preserve the secrecy of the vote as well as enabled voters to vote as per their choice The ballot paper was replaced for the first time with electronic voting machines in 1982 on an experimental basis for by-elections to Parur Assembly constituency in the South Indian state of Kerala. The Representation of People Act 1951 was amended in 1989 to provide for the use of EVMs. General elections from the year 2004 have been conducted via EVMs only. thus technology became an integral part of the electoral process in 2013 the voter verifiable paper audit trail or vvpat was introduced to enable a voter to verify that their vote has only gone to the candidate of their choice a printer attached with the evm in the voting compartment prints the name and symbol of the candidate for whom a voter has voted This printed slip remains exposed for 7 seconds under a transparent window and gets cut automatically and falls into a drop box which remains sealed. A VVPAT was first used in Noxen, an assembly constituency of the North East Indian state of Nagaland in the September of 2013. As a pilot project in the year 2014, Indian general elections Eight out of 543 parliamentary constituencies use the VVPAT system. During 2019 general elections, VVPATs were deployed in all polling stations of the country. Election Commission of India believes that the introduction of VVPAT has brought utmost transparency and credibility in the EVM-based voting system and conclusively put to rest all misinformed doubts and misgivings regarding these machines and the voting process. Antra Sinha for DD India 
Army Commanders Conference is currently underway in New Delhi. The apex leadership of the Army is deliberating upon the emerging threat scenario, operational challenges, reforms and plans for modernization. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will be addressing the conference on Tuesday. One of the key items on the agenda are cyber security, integration with other services and futuristic warfare technologies. Welfare of ex-servicemen, administrative and reforms also figure. The Army Commanders Conference, the first for the year 2024, was held in virtual mood on March 28th and thereafter the two-day physical mood begins on Monday. Now let's take a look at other stories making news today. Enforcement Directorate will submit a report on Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal's arrest in the liquor policy case to Delhi High Court today. Earlier, Kejriwal has challenged his arrest and remand of ED. Meanwhile, a bail plea of former Delhi Deputy CM Manish Sisodia is going to be heard today in Delhi's Rouse Avenue Court. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachur praised the new criminal laws recently enacted by Parliament during Central Bureau of Investigation Raising Day, calling it a significant step towards modernising the justice system. CGI said this comprehensive approach ensures a seamless flow of information and is intended to facilitate better coordination and collaboration among stakeholders involved in the investigative and adjudicatory processes. Amidst tightened security, Indian Air Force conducted a trial run of 3.5 km long emergency landing facility on Jammu Srinagar National Highway in northernmost state of Jammu and Kashmir on Monday. Initiated in 2020, the project aims to provide an alternative landing facility for fighter jets and other aircraft in scenarios like wartime situations or natural disasters requiring swift mobilization of resources. 19 traditional products and crafts of northeastern state of Assam, including Bihu Jol, Japi, and several items of the border tribe, have been accorded the geographical indication or GI tag. Additionally, two indigenous products from another northeastern state of Tripura, the Pera of Tripureshwari Temple and the Rignai Pachra, have also been accorded the GI tag. Spots now Rajasthan Royals on Monday secured their third consecutive victory in IPL 2024 by defeating Mumbai Indians by six wickets. Mumbai Indians, who played their first home game at the Wang Khede, have had a terrible start this season as this was their third consecutive defeat. Opting to bowl are a restricted MI to 125 for nine and chase down the target comfortably with 27 balls to spare. Rian Parag scored a half century for the second consecutive time this season with an unbeaten 54 of 39 balls on Monday that anchored RR's successful run chase. Coco now, India's 56th National Coco Championship concluded on Monday in New Delhi. Maharashtra won the championship, beating railways in the men's final. It was a thrilling encounter with both teams ending at 32-32 in regular time. The two teams locked horns again in another innings in which Maharashtra edged railways in the dying moments of the match, beating them 52-50 to win the trophy. Maharashtra won the women's final and you can see the medal ceremony there. Well, that's all for this edition of DD India Live. But do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news. As it breaks here on DD India, I'm Abhishek Mahajan. From all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India Live.